the computer recording has started. Yeah, yeah. Recording started. Mm -hmm. All right. Backup is rolling. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchise. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation and we may begin, Chair. Good morning. I'm Councilman uh, Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Um, I'd like to say that we have been joined remotely today by Council Members Gridencheck, Lander, uh, and Levine. Before we begin, I would like to note that LU's number 694 and 695 for the Special Flushing Waterfront District proposal are being laid over. Uh, today, we will hold public hearings for a number of preconsidered LU items, including 1501 and 1555 uh, 60th Street rezoning on the ULURP numbers C200006, uh, 200086, ZMK, and N00087, uh, ZRK, and the 265 Front Street rezoning under ULURP's numbers C150178, ZMK, and N180178, ZRK. We will also uh, hold hearings on LU-698 for a zoning uh, special permit, which is connected to LU, LU's number uh, 696 and 697, which, are heard by this sub, which were heard by this subcommittee on November 18th for related zoning map and text amendments. Together, the latter three actions comprise the 312 Coney Island Avenue proposal. Also on today's agenda are a number of votes, including the Bedford Avenue overlay extension and the 803 Rockaway Avenue rezoning, the Mansion Restaurant uh, Cafe text amendment, and uh, 312 Coney Island Avenue rezoning, all of which were the subject of prior hearings by the subcommittee. Before we begin, uh, I would like to now recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public uh, wishing to testify in today's hearing were asked to register online. If you wish to testify and have not already done so, we ask that you please visit the council's website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. Members of the public may view a live stream broadcast of this hearing at the New York City Council website. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. The applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first. Public witness panels will be uh, called in groups of up to four names at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. There is a slight delay in the process of unmuting. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participant panel. Council members with questions will be uh, called in order as they raise their hands, and Chair Moya will then recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this hearing due to uh, various technical reasons, and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Arthur. Um, and I just want to make a correction. Uh, we have Council Member Levin uh, that is present with us here today. 
Um, I now open up the public hearing on LU 698 for a zoning special permit, which is part of the 312 Coney Island Avenue rezoning proposal, which also includes LU's 696 and 697 for a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment. Uh, I'll note that in conjunction with the related LU's uh, 696 and 697, this subcommittee held a public hearing at our November 18th meeting and took comprehensive testimony concerning the anticipated development under the proposal in its entirety. Uh, that is pursuant to all three related actions. The 312 Coney Island Avenue proposal relates to property in council member Landers district in Brooklyn. The special permit application seeks a waiver of the residential accessory parking requirements for the proposed building. In conjunction with the related land use actions, the proposal is intended to facilitate the development of a new mixed use building with an approximate height of 14 stories, approximately two 178 units, 5,000 square feet of ground floor retail space, and a new 30,000 square foot church facility. The hearing is now open on the special permit action. As we have previously taken testimony on this project as a whole, we are not planning to hear from the applicant team today. Uh, Council, could you please confirm whether we have anyone wishing to testify on the 312 Coney Island Avenue application? If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on LU 698 for the 312 Coney Island Avenue zoning special permit, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for members of the public. Chair Moya, I see no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Thank you, Arthur. There being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU 698 for the 312 Coney Island uh, Avenue special permit, the public hearing is now closed. Before we continue with our other hearings on today's agenda, at this time we are going to move to our votes. Uh, today, we will vote to approve with modifications to LU's number 696 and 697 and 698 for the 312 Coney Island Avenue rezoning related to property in Council Member Landers District in Brooklyn. The application seeks a zoning map amendment to change a C82 district to an R8A C24 district within the Special Ocean Parkway District. A related zoning text amendment to modify height and setback requirements in certain R. R8A districts, as well as to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing, utilizing options one and two, and a zoning special permit to waive the required residential accessory parking requirement. To ensure that the proposed plan is implemented, our modification for the text amendment would be to strike MIH option two while retaining option one. And we will also include certain bulk modifications within the proposed text. We will also modify the parking special permit to require the number of spaces that the applicant has proposed to include. At this time, I would like to recognize my colleague, uh, Council Member Landers, uh, Lander for some remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Moy. I really appreciate your uh, work and your leadership here to the other members of the committee, council members Gridenchik and, and Jaeger. Thank you for being here. Um, I wanna say a big thank you to the staff who put a lot of time in on this. Um, and of course, to my uh, community as well, who have shown up in significant numbers. You know, when we had the public hearing on this, several dozen people testified um, and they were about evenly split on this proposal uh, with many uh, members of the church supporting the proposal. Um, and many of the neighbors around uh, the site opposing it, um, you know, and that was challenging as these processes often are. Uh, together with council member Robert Carroll, we've tried hard to listen um, and do something that works in the community and would be appropriate and contextual, but that has been hard. And we've heard loud and clear the community's concerns about the height and density of the developer's proposal for a 14 story building along Park Circle and Ocean Parkway adjacent to a nine story building and then to some quite low rise buildings six and seven across the circle, um, you know, and, 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 you know, a couple family homes sort of just a block away. So we've been looking for a way to reduce the height 
and put the building more in context with its neighbors. But the choices are limited here. The council can only do what's in scope. Staff advised that one thing that would be in scope would be R7X, which would cut the density by 20%, but not have any lower height limit. So the building could still rise to 14 stories. Um, there are many people in the community who would like the council to reject the proposal altogether. And I spent a lot of time listening to them. And you know, I think what people would like is if the church could remain as it is. It's been there a long time. People you know, are comfortable with it. It's a nice open space or maybe an R7A development would come instead, which is not in scope of this action, but perhaps could be the subsequent action. But I'll just be honest, if the, with the lot already up for development and having been essentially put on the market, if we leave the current underlying zoning in place, what I think we'll get is a CubeSmart or a self-storage facility like the one next door, which is 11 stories tall, 110 foot CubeSmart. You could have a 17 story hotel, a homeless shelter, an office building, all as of right, um, none of which provide any housing opportunities, but also I think which you know are as of right and would happen without any of the kinds of negotiations that are possible here. So what we did with all of that in mind uh, is push back hard and, and negotiated and what the developers have now agreed to um, is something that reduces the height of the building along Park Circle and Ocean Parkway from 14 stories down to 11 under the text amendment that the chair describes. So binding in zoning, um, that would be much more in context with what will be a nine story building kind of behind and adjacent to it at 57 Caton Place, um, and then rise a little higher uh, along the back, but with height that would not be visible from the circle um, or Prospect Park so beautifully across the street. Um, that change will be written into the zoning through a binding text modification and would survive sale or transfer. Um, we also are amending the application, as the chair mentioned, to require parking spaces for 40% of the units um, and to only uh, to require MIH option one so that 25% of the units would be at the deepest affordability allowed under our zoning. I'm not trying to convince anyone that this is great. Um, and I know a lot of people are, you know, uh, want something better of us. And I feel that this was a neighborhood that just a few years ago was a real working class, diverse, low rise place. And that people don't like seeing it transformed by big development, largely market rate. It doesn't feel like the neighborhoods that we loved and, and lived in. Um, and I hear that and I feel it myself. That said, um, it really is my considered opinion that of the options that are on the table for us today, this one modifying the R8A, so the height along Park Circle and Ocean Parkway comes down from 14 to 11 stories. The density is reduced by about 8%. We only allow MIH option one. We require that parking. Um, is the best option that's available to us today. So um, I uh, encourage my colleagues to vote yes with modifications on this amendment. We believe the modifications that we are proposing are in scope. Uh, and I think, you know, they, they get us through today um, as, as productively as we can under a challenging set of circumstances. I'll continue to fight for a more comprehensive planning approach that lets neighborhoods take the lead rather than developers under the circumstances we have, I think, this is what makes the most sense. Thank you for the time. Thank you, uh, Council Member Lander. Uh, we will also vote to approve uh, LU 699 for the Bedford Avenue overlay extension relating to the property in Council Member Reynoso's district in Brooklyn. The application seeks a zoning map amendment to map a C24 commercial overlay district within the existing R6B district along Bedford Avenue between Grand Street and North First Street in Williamsburg. The, proposed, uh, the proposal would facilitate the development of a three-story mixed-use building at uh, 276 Bedford Avenue with ground floor commercial use and residential use on the upper floors. Council Member Reynoso is in support of this proposal. We will also vote to approve LU's number uh, 700, 701, and the 803 Rockaway Avenue rezoning proposal relating to property in Council Member Barron's district in Brooklyn. The, applica the application seeks a zoning map amendment to change the M11 district to a mix of M14 R7A and an M14 R6A districts, and a zoning text amendment to establish, uh, establish special mixed use district uh, MX-19 and to modify certain regulations in the MX-19 district and to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing uh, 
area utilizing option one. Uh, the actions are intended to facilitate the development of a new building with uh, ground floor manufacturing space uh, along with community facility space and approximately 174 affordable and supportive housing units. Uh, Council member Barron is in support of the proposal. Um, and we would also, uh, we will also be taking a vote to approve LU702 for the Mansion Cafe text amendment relating to property in Council Member Kalos's district in Manhattan. The application seeks a zoning text amendment to allow unenclosed sidewalk cafes within the C15 district at the northeast corner of 86th Street in New York. This action would facilitate uh, subject to a separate city uh, licensing process for the cafe itself and an unenclosed sidewalk cafe with 23 tables and 47 seats. Accessory, accessory to the uh, Mansion Cafe located at 1634 York Avenue. Council Member Kalos is in support of the proposal. And I now call uh, for a vote to approve with the modifications I have described, LUs 696, 697, and 698, and to approve LUs 699, 700, 701, and 702. Council, can you please call the roll? Chair Moya. I vote aye. Council Member Levin. I vote aye. Council Member Gordenchik. I guess I have to vote. There aren't many of us left on this subcommittee. I vote aye. Chair, the vote currently stands at three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstentions. We are going to keep this vote open. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I now want to open the public hearing on pre-considered LU items for the 1501, 1555 60th Street rezoning proposal relating to property in council member Yeager's district in Brooklyn. The ULIP application numbers for these pre-considered items are C200086 ZMK and N00087 ZRK. The application seeks a rezoning a, a seeks a zoning map amendment to replace an existing M11 district with an R7A uh, C24 district and a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. These actions are intended to facilitate the development of three buildings, two on the north side and one on the south side of 60th Street between 15th and 16th Avenues. The buildings on the north side of the street would each be seven stories with ground floor commercial and residential use above, including 23 and 39 units in each buildings, with, while the building on the south side of the street would be eight stories with ground floor commercial and 40 units on the upper floors. Uh, Council, uh, if you could uh, please call the first panel for this item. Uh, apologies, Chair. If before I call the first panel for this item, would it be possible for you to just take us back to the vote? Um, we can get another vote. Yep. Uh, on a continuing vote for the land use items, Council Member Reynoso. I'm sorry. Can can I pass for for one minute, Chair? Sure. One second. I'm so sorry. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the applicant panel for this item will include Eric Palatnik, land use counselor for the applicant. Uh, panelists, Mr. Palatnik, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. I did in fact do that. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I can hear you. Great, great. Uh, counselor, Hello, everybody. Hold on one second, uh, Council, if you can please administer the affirmation. Ms. Blanick, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. May I proceed? You may proceed. 
Thank you. First, thank you everybody for being here bright eyed and cheery on a Monday morning and for hearing the applications and for leading New York City into a future. It definitely feels like we are at the cusp of something different than we've been at in the past. And thank you for being the people that are at the forefront of what's happening uh, as far as development goes. We're here today as the chair had mentioned uh, for a project or a development that's within uh, Councilman Calvin Yeager's district, I see him here, uh, that would result in, uh, from an, as a rezoning from an M11 to an R7A district uh, with a C24 overlay. And if the, if the team uh, may bring up the uh, presentation, I don't know how that goes, if I have to ask for it or not, but whoever's in charge, I can start making a presentation. Eric, uh, I, I hate to interrupt, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just have to get the, uh, a quick vote back on. Take your uh, time. We've been joined by uh, Council Member Rivera and she's chairing her committee right now. So we just wanna get her vote and uh, Council Member Reynoso's vote if he's ready. A continuing vote uh, for the land use items, Council Member Rivera. Council member Reynoso. Uh, I will, I don't know. It's my first hearing back since I've had, had my child. So I'm a little uh, off the rails, but I'm getting back on it. So I'm sorry, chair. And thank you for uh, congratulations again. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thanks. Council member, congratulations. Thank you, thank you uh, both. I of uh, five in the affirmative, zero in the negative and no abstentions. The items are adopted and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. All right, sorry about that, Eric. Wait, we gotta unmute you, Eric. Hold on, hold on. There you go. Thank you, Eric. Eric, you're 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 muted. Yep. How's that? Did it work then? Now you got it. All right. Third time. Uh, third time's a charm. Uh, Mazel Tov to Councilman Reynoso. You and your family. It's a real blessing. Uh, so as I was suggesting, if it was okay, I don't know how I prompt for the screen to come up, if now would be the right time for that. And I could start talking while the screen is up there, whoever's in charge. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so we'll pause here for just one moment. Uh, what we're talking about is asking you for permission, if you can all hear me, okay, good. Uh, to rezone this block, which is on 60th Street between 15th and 16th Avenue in the Borough Park neighborhood of Brooklyn, from an M11 to an R7A slash C24. It would be symbiotic with the Maple Lanes development, which you could see at the lower right-hand corner of this screen, which was the subject of a rezoning from 2013 to an R6A. And that is now fully built and developed, and you'll see that. The properties sit on a block front that has historically been serviced or developed upon with automotive related uses, some scattered furniture stores, some other wholesale sales uses, and some scattered residential. It's surrounded on all sides uh, by a residential neighborhood. And you can see that in the aerial. Uh, part of the discussion we're gonna be presenting with you today is a discussion that developed at the community board where Councilman Calvin Yeager was present at uh, with the properties that are to the north of us. And those properties that are to the north of us on 59th Street uh, raised some discussion at the community board, which took place just before COVID took full force in February of 2020. And the residents were all there. And the proposed buildings, as the, as the chair mentioned, were proposed to be seven stories on the north side of the street, sites A and B. And I'm gonna preface up my conversation by saying as a result of conversations, the community board requested that those buildings A and B be reduced to six stories. And we've been speaking with the councilman and I'll let him embellish on how we may be able to achieve that. So the proposal that we're here for today is for a rezoning from an R7A to a C, from an M11 to an R7A C24 that would result in residential developments on both sides of the block, an eight story building on site C up against the railroad tracks, but sites A and B would be at six stories. If approved as proposed with the modifications that I was suggesting, uh, it would create 92 dwelling units that would have 26 affordable units within it at option level two. If we brought it to option one, it would be 24 affordable units. So next slide, please. This just summarizes everything I just spoke about in words. So I'm gonna skip past it. It's everything I just spoke about. Next slide, please. 
on the right and the left of your screen. Can everybody see that? Because one of my devices is not following along. You should see the zoning map change right now. I don't know if you could see it clearly, but if you can, you can see on the uh, next slide, please. We'll go to, that'll show you. Next slide. Here are the uses that are on the block that I described earlier. Up, go back one slide, please. This gives you an idea for the haphazard uses that I mentioned. You could see all along the block front, you could see on starting at the top left, two-story furniture store, a two-story warehouse and office. There happens to be a tennis court on top of the furniture store. You will note that because there, there are residents that, that, that live around, I think that own that building and use it to play some tennis. Uh, you could see some two-story residential buildings, an office building, some factories and a warehouse. On the south side of the street, you can see an HVAC supply store and a one-story auto body shop and some more auto body shops, along with some residential that's along 15th Avenue. So what we're trying to display here is the mixed use character of the block. Next slide, please. This gives you a depiction of what the sites look like. They're not necessarily developed upon uh, with beautiful looking structures. They have had a useful past, but that past is behind them and they are haphazardly rented up right now with various uses. Uh, next slide, please. The newer building that you see on the left, uh, that was built uh, recently, that was built by the owner as a, as a placeholder uh, for their business. Uh, it is not meant for that building to be surviving. That is one of the development sites. On the lower screen on the left side in view six, you can see some of the older uh, row houses that still exist in the neighborhood. That's to the left of the development sites. The development site is view four, and then you can see view five as well. Uh, to the right of view five with the black awning. Next slide, please. This gives you a view of site C. This is uh, view 13, 14, 15. They all show you view 13, shows you Maple Lanes, which I mentioned in the, in the earlier part of the presentation. Between us and Maple Lanes is the railroad cut that I mentioned a moment ago. You can see the cars that are on the block for the auto repair and the way they're sort of just placed all over the block. Next slide, please. Here you can see the proposed zoning change. It gives you the depiction of the map. The left side of the screen shows you the existing zoning, which is an M1-1. You could see that the M11, if you, it's, it's interesting, it just sort of wraps up and cuts between the R6A and the R5 on the left side on 15th Avenue, and then sneaks into our block. Uh, so we're, we're really looking to eliminate that because it's really a vestige of the past. Uh, and, and the true M1 zone is to the south of us. You can see there on 62nd Street on the other side of the tracks, literally. Next slide, please. This gives you a depiction of the buildings. This slide is a good slide, even though it's the introductory slide, just because it shows you buildings A and B are on the, the top of your screen. Those are the buildings that were suggesting or was suggested at the community board level uh, that they should be cut down by one story. And that's the recommendation you have from the community board that says that. The community board also asked that we increase the number of parking spaces beyond the minimum required, which is 32, and they asked for 71 spaces, and we've agreed to provide both of those uh, requests. Next slide, please. This just gives you the zoning calculations, again, laying out the, the, the sites for you. You'll notice lot 62 between A and B as we're going ahead. The owner is currently in negotiations. Well, with lot, the owner of this eight, our sites are in negotiations with the owner of lot 62 right now to purchase that. Next slide, please. This just gives you another aerial depiction. I think these slides are helpful to depict what's going on behind us. Similar to what Councilman Lander mentioned a moment ago with the juxtaposition of various height buildings and, and, and typography of building types around us. Uh, there, there is a, a conflict to some extent with the homes behind us. Uh, and those are the people that came and spoke at the community board, even though they're not here today. And they spoke in droves and they spoke about concerns about the light and air. We are providing an extended rear yard. We're exceeding the 35 foot rear yard, I believe. Uh, I'll give you the dimension of that in a second while I'm looking. But the other request was that I mentioned a moment ago was to reduce the height uh, from uh, buildings A and B from seven stories to six stories. Uh, we would still be using most of the floor area 
it would result in buildings that were 4.3 and 4.17 FAR respectively. So we're still close to the 4.6 allowable under the R7A, but we just lowered the height. And I, to the rear yard or 30 foot rear yard is required. We've agreed to extend it to 38 feet. So nearly 10, eight feet longer than is required on the homes on the right hand side. Next slide, please. Uh, this just gives you an idea for what the buildings look like from the street, the healthcare apparel building in the middle sticks out like a sore thumb. That is the site that we are looking to acquire right now. Next slide, please. The, the remainder of the slides just give you more of these, these uh, general overviews of, of, of the community and of the, what it looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and that, the, the rest of them are just the buildings themselves. If you can click through to the end of the plans uh, or you can actually turn it off, I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody may have. I think you've gotten the gist of what we're proposing and I'd be happy to go into any specific plan that you may all deem appropriate. Thank you very much for allowing me to present. Great, thank you, uh, Eric. A uh, couple of questions here um, when we're talking about the affordable housing. Uh, can yeah. you just go back into and and speak about the rationale for the uh, proposal of uh, MIH option two? The the MIH we're, we're happy to to change it to to option one. By the way, uh, the, 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 that is not a concern of ours. We're happy to accommodate, and I think I've mentioned this to you, uh, uh, Chair, that that the option one uh, actually works for developers. So this, the the relationships are symbiotic. So we're happy to do that. Uh, the, the reason it was chosen at option two uh, is because it yields more units uh, and, and more units are derived from that. But uh, we're, we're, we're mutually amenable to, to what the, the council should decide. All right. So when, when you talk about uh, it yields more units, what is the mix of uh, the proposed unit size sizes like studio, uh, one bedroom, two bedrooms, three bedrooms? What are the, it's primarily, the, it's a good question and I've actually anticipated it. I have it here for you. Uh, so the, the, the mix that it comes out to is the, it, it's, it's about, it's 32 units, uh, 10 of them are uh, four bedrooms, uh, nine of them are three bedrooms, seven are two bedrooms, and five are one bedrooms. So 14, 24, 32, I got it right. So that mix shows you, if you, if you wrote that down, I show you, you know, noting it down, the majority of them are four bedrooms. Uh, the, the, and, and, and the majority of them are larger, 10 10 four bedrooms, nine three bedrooms. Uh, that represents, of course, the, the primary demographic of the existing community that lives in the surrounding area. And the appeal of this, of course, is to try to attract uh, younger families uh, that, that don't have the higher income levels that are trying to root themselves in, uh, in near other religious facilities, schools, uh, and other uh, similar uh, you know, neighborhood services that, that they found themselves used to using throughout their lives. So that's why we just designed it in that way. But again, we are happy if, if in your wisdom, you feel uh, the AMI option one would be more well suited. We're happy to amenable to the, the suggestion. Okay. Um, and are you proposing to partner uh, up with a local non-for-profit organization to be the administrative yeah. agent for the affordable housing? I, I failed to mention uh, some of the, some of the uh, components of the project, which thank you for bringing it up. Uh, we are talking right now to a not-for-profit uh, co-sponsor that would administer the, the affordable units. Uh, we're not necessarily, uh, we don't have a deal struck yet, so we don't really want to mention the name publicly yet, but we're close to making one. Uh, we're also uh, intending, of course, to have minority, we make commitments at the borough president's level to minority women-owned businesses, uh, as well as to engage with Brooklyn workforce innovations, uh, as well as other, uh, we're, we're, we have not been approached yet by 32BJ, but we're also happy to talk to 32BJ about having uh, their members uh, work the building. So uh, 32BJ, I think has been a little tied up recently on a bunch of other things, but we, we intend to speak to them. So we intend to try to do as much as we can to fulfill the social program of the building in addition to the physical components of it. Great, all right. So um, I'm gonna skip to my questions because you, you touched a little bit upon local hiring and MWBEs. Um, what can you tell me or tell us about the plans for local hiring and construction? 
there's been no builder yet selected, of course, but the owner is very local. They have no intention of selling the property. They will be building it themselves. Uh, and we will be using locally sourced labor as purchasing most of our building supplies uh, very locally as well. So uh, we're pleased to commit to that. We have every intention of using local labor and uh, we're, we're happy to engage in a dialogue to pursue and to make those commitments in writing. That, that'd be great. Um, and also how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? I don't know, I'll find out. Please, because I also wanna make sure that how do we ensure follow-up you know, in, 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 in a progress report on the commitments that are being made right here um, for local hires and MWBEs. Okay. Um, I got just one more question. Uh, as the board president noted that when uh, proposing a rezoning from a manufacturing district to a residential district, there is concern that the uh, incentivized development will lead to business displacement. One, how do you respond to these concerns regarding displacement of existing businesses? And two, have you conducted any outreach uh, to any of the businesses outside the applicant controlled sites within the proposed rezoning area? I personally have not spoken to the other owners outside the site, except for one. I've spoken to the, the owner of the property on the corner with the tennis court, and they are uh, acceptable, accepting of the idea. That's a furniture store at the lower level with the tennis court upstairs. So only in Brooklyn do you get that kind of mix. You can just tennis and, and furniture. Uh, the remainder of the block, as far as speaking to the, the, the businesses go, the owners of the, the sites that we control have definitely spoken to those businesses and they're well aware. Uh, I believe they've sp spoken to a couple of other people on the block. I don't know exactly who, but every, it's a tight knit community. Everybody has certainly been made aware of it. Uh, with respect to the, and, and the community board was quite vocal uh, at the, and it's right down the block. Uh, with respect to the businesses that are there and their displacement, uh, they're auto body shops. They don't need to be located in the middle of a dense urban residential neighborhood. They don't have much business being there, in my opinion, anymore. I think that's a leftover from a time when the best we could do was auto body. Uh, not to say there's anything wrong with it. Some of my good friends own auto body shops. Uh, what I'm suggesting, or work there too, what I'm suggesting is that those can be relocated. There is abundant space for them. Uh, for an auto body type use and the owner is working with them to get them relocated and we'll find a favorable location for them and won't leave them high and dry. They've all been there for many years as a tenant and uh, that's a personal relationship that will continue after this. But is there, is there an existing plan that you have um, to make, uh, to, to do outreach to the businesses that um, are within the proposed rezoning area? I do not, I do not know specifically if they have approached each of the individual owners. If it would be okay with the committee, I'd like to get back to you on that and find out if he has, in fact, spoken to everybody. Uh, like I said, everybody tends to know everybody. The block is owned by people who are all local residents. So I will talk and find out for you. Thank you. That 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 would be helpful. Uh, okay, that's um, all the questions I have um, for, for you, Eric. Um, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your presentation. Um, I now invite uh, my colleagues to ask questions. If you have any questions for the applicant panel, please use the raise hand button on the participant panel. Uh, council, are there any council members with questions? No, Chair, I see no members with questions at this time. Great. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is now excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 60th Street rezoning application? If there are any other members of the public, uh, any members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the 60th Street rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for members of the public.
Chair Moya, I see no members of the public uh, who wish to testify on this item. Um, there being no members uh, of the public who wish to testify, uh, the panel is uh, now excused. Okay, there being no members of the public who should testify on the pre-considered LU item for the 60th Street rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the application is laid over. Uh, I now want to open the public hearing on the 265 Front Street rezoning relating to property in Council Member Levin's district in Brooklyn. The ULERP application numbers for these pre-considered items are C150178 ZMK and N180178 ZRK. The application includes a zoning map amendment to change an M12 district to an R6A district with a C24 overlay, as well as a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options, uh, option one. These actions would facilitate the development of a new four-story mixed-use building with ground floor commercial space and approximately nine housing units on the upper floors. I would like to now recognize uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Levin, for some remarks. Do we have Council Member Levin? There he is. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I, I look forward to uh, hearing the testimony from the applicant on uh, this matter, 265 Front Street, which is in um, the neighborhood of Vinegar Hill. Uh, Vinegar Hill is a, uh, a very small, um, uh, just about two block stretch um, in the uh, eastern, northeastern corner of, um, excuse me, south, southeastern corner of, um, of the Dumbo area between Dumbo and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And um, uh, it's generally a low rise uh, neighborhood. Um, this application, uh, as the applicant will tell you, is an R6A application. Um, um, at the outset, I'll just, I'll just note that um, uh, we had requested that um, uh, that the application um, uh, have a an alternate application of an R six B, um, which uh, the the city planning commission um, did not accept as a as a um, as an alternate application. And so. Uh, where we are today is is with the R six A, um, but the community has expressed um, reservations on that and um, much more of a willingness to consider an R six B. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Council Member Levin. Uh, Council, can you please call the first uh, panel for this item? The applicant panel will again include Eric Blanick, Land Use Council for the applicant, and. Joseph Pasatoro. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request uh, in order to begin. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Great. And Joseph, you. Joseph, you may want to mute yourself, Joseph. Great, thank you. Joseph, there was a lot of background noise there, so uh, we couldn't really hear you. Uh, Council, can you please administer the affirmation? Panelists, please raise your right hands. 
you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we have received your slideshow presentation for this proposal, and um, when we are ready, when we are ready to present it, just please say so, uh, and it will be displayed on screen for you. Slides will be advanced for you when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and advancing of slides. Uh, members of the public needing an accessible version of this presentation are asked to please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now panelists, uh, please state your name uh, and uh, affiliation for the record. And with that, we may begin. Hello again, my name is Eric Palatnik and I'm an attorney representing the Spinard family who uh, has their project manager and, and tight friend and business partner, Joseph Passatore, who's on the phone today. Uh, this one has a story to it. So if you bear with me for a couple of minutes, I'll tell everybody the story because I personally found it to be one of the more fascinating zoning stories. I know you all have a lot going on. Councilman Levin deserves an award. He's tried very hard to broker deals with everybody and he's trying to make the best of it. Uh, if we could go to the first slide, please, and then I'll tell you the story, because I think if you see the picture, picture's worth a thousand words. So bring up the presentation, please. Okay. So what you're looking at is a beautiful part of Brooklyn, a great part of Brooklyn, Vinegar Hill. There's a wonderful article in the Times that talks about its history. It's like stepping back in time. It's a low scale neighborhood, like the councilman says. Uh, it doesn't, it does, it's zoned in a way that the site is an M12 zoning district. The parking lot to the left across Gold Street is an R6B. And the lots across the street, which includes the yellow fence is an R6A. And the building that's in the foreground on the right side is an R6A residential building. Our site is an M1. Behind us, you can see a brick building on Gold Street. That's residential. The rest of the block on Gold Street is residential. The neighborhood is a residential neighborhood. The people that we've been meeting with include the Vinegar Hill Association, the Councilman, Community Board 2, and the Borough President. Those meetings have been going on for five years to ask to create a four-story residential building. It's an R6A request. We're asking for a four-story building. We're not filed as an R6B because we were asked to encourage the whole way to be an R6A. And when we got to the end and, and things kind of blew up at the community board level when we got there and we'd been talking to the neighbors before that and, and, and we, we all kind of felt encouraged enough that we had made commitments that we promised to lock the building in at a four story building and we promised to restrict, we have a commercial overlay proposed. We promised to restrict the ground floor to any uses they wanted, restrict it to four stories, 48 feet, and a ground floor commercial with limited commercial uses, no bakeries, no, uh, no food stuff, uh, no, nothing that brings noise, nothing 24 hours, things like banks, uh, things like vets, uh, things like that, veterinarians. Uh, we thought we had things going very communicatively with the community board until about a couple of months into the ULRP when we got certified. At that point, they hired two attorneys, Stuart Klein and another gentleman, we had a meeting in Councilman Levin's office. He tried to broker a deal. We could not come to an agreement. So they came to the community board and they'll testify here today against the application because they want to see R6B. We want to see R6B too. The city would not let us switch it to an R6B. It was asked by everybody. It was asked by me. It was asked by the borough president. It was asked by the councilman. We all wanted to accommodate the neighbors. It was asked by the city to be left at R6A. It went to a city planning commission hearing. We asked again, we begged them to lower it to an R6B. Some commissioners agreed with us. There's testimony on the record, you could hear them. They felt it would be foolish to throw out the baby with the bathwater in this instance, because if this is rezoned, the site right now is being used for the parking of heavy equipment, diesel trucks. The owners are 75 year old men. They've been driving their trucks for 60, 50 years, they're done. They're gonna sell the property. And everybody in the neighborhood knows that the city will not support an R6B zoning. And everybody's gonna know that we're gonna to lose today and the property will be left either as it is 
or another permitted M1 use, which I don't think you'll hear anybody in the conversation say they want to see. So the dilemma that we're here presenting to you is to find some infinite wisdom. And we've agreed to a restrictive declaration. We've agreed to tie it down however we possibly can. Unfortunately, we cannot create a, as creative a solution as Councilman Lander created with a, a text change a few minutes ago. That's a beautiful solution to that problem. But we're in this uh, period where we're between two uh, symbiotic interests and there's no route in the mechanism in the, in the process to achieve those interests other than a restrictive declaration. So we have proposed a restrictive declaration to limit the height not even to an R6B, to a four-story building, 48 feet tall. It mimics, in most cases, uh, uh, an R6B. It's, it's a little bit bigger in the floor. It's a 2.6 FAR, 48-foot height, nine dwelling units. It does not provide MIH because the lower size of it that, that the neighborhood wants, which is what we've been negotiating the whole time with them, We've been designing it the whole time to address everybody's concerns. It's always been proposed to be the smaller building. And we have included it as an R6A proposal because that is what the city had asked us to create. And that, that was the guidance we were following, but we were simply designing it to accommodate everybody. So that is my big, long drawn out. That's the, the whole name of the game in this application. The pictures are very simple. The building is extremely simple. The zoning map is simple and the number of units are simple. It's the, it's the people that matter in this application. It's not necessarily the bricks and mortar. So if we can go to the, the next few slides, I'll just give you a couple of minutes of it and then I'll open it up. I know you have a lot of people that wanna speak and I'd love for you to hear them. Uh, next slide, please. He was able to hear me say that, there he goes. I just was checking if the sound didn't work. I didn't mean we weren't paying attention. Next slide, please. It's a bit of a lag, so we'll bear with it. This was uh, the article I was mentioning before. This is how beautiful the neighborhood is. Gorgeous, spectacular. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of weeds on the tree bed on the left, but other than that, the place is beautiful. It's like stepping back in time. I would love to live there. And I know I could see its charm. Next slide, please. I was joking around here a little bit, showing you we're sort of like Dustin Hoffman. We're trying to be tootsie, everything to everybody. We're caught up in a fight over the baby. In the middle of it, a pandemic broke out. And at the end, it's pretty much like Kramer versus Kramer, which is a tragedy where nobody wins. And that's what we want to avoid. Next slide. Plus, who doesn't like Dustin Hoffman? He's a good actor. Next slide, please. Okay, so here you can see the zoning map. I'll pause here for a minute. This is what I was telling you a second ago. This is like, you know, I was driving home with my kids yesterday and we were getting, we came to a corner and my son who's seven years old said, why is there a gas station on every corner? You know, it was a good land use question for a seven year old. I was impressed by it. It's the same thing here. You know, let's go back one if you can, just to the map. Um, I apologize. Uh, the map is showing you that every corner, I guess we can't get to it, but every corner is R6, except for ours. Some iteration, either R6B or R6A. This shows you what you saw before. You can clearly see the bottom of the screen is residential. You can clearly see the residential behind us. Next slide, please. Okay, this next slide. Keep coming to the same slides. Next slide. Let's see if we can get past these. Next slide. If you can get up to the plans. That would be, oh, these stop here. This is good. Pause here. This gives you a beautiful picture of what's going on in the neighborhood. If ever there was an application where a rezoning made sense, it would be this picture. View one shows you the residential buildings on the left. View two, three at the bottom shows you a glimmer of the apartment building across the street. View two is one of my most expressive photographs. There's a city bike bike rack 
I'm not trying to be the, the guy that plays up the drama, but if you notice the gate behind it, you can see the top of a red diesel truck. I wouldn't let my kids get onto a city bike out of that bike rack if, if their life depended on it. They would never touch it. Uh, there's, a, there's heavy equipment coming out across the street. It doesn't belong next to a city bike rack. Next slide, please. Here is another good picture, view four. It gives you a great example. Uh, is obviously a resident walking their dog and next to them is a diesel truck parked the wrong way on the street. You can see the way the street is beat up in front of the property. It's been paved over, view six shows you through the years. It's been paved over there because they use it intensely. The trucks start, they're loud, they're noisy and they certainly don't mix and match if you look at view five with what's going on across the street. So that's, that's the essence of what we're asking for here. Next slide, please. I think you're getting the picture, so I'll stop harping on that. Next slide. If you can go right to the plans next, that would be great. So you can see what it looks like. I think it's towards the end. And then, uh, and then we're pretty much done with our presentation. I think you've all, uh, I wanted to walk you through the neighborhood, give you a sense for what it looked like. I uh, wanted to let you see what was going on in the property, let you know what the problem is that we were having. Uh, and we're gonna click forward if you can to the plans. Uh, and uh, we'll show you a little bit of what, what the building looks like in a rendering. Uh, so you can see how nice it looks and how it matches in here. You can stop here. This gives you a sense we, we're trying. Oh, you saw it for a second on the last shot. Maybe if you go to the end, there's a rendering at the end. Uh, I think there should be a color one at the very end, but if not, this will do. What we're showing you here is that the building is designed with an aesthetic feeling to it, which we're willing to commit to. We're willing to commit to that, that, that Brooklyn uh, brownstone row house feel uh, with, with the, the stone at the base, with the arches and the brickwork upstairs. Here you could see a, a section of the building. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to get to. So here you could see what we're proposing. Obviously, the streetscape doesn't look quite that nice in the neighborhood we're in. It's a little bit more eclectic. Uh, it's not so well lined with white lines. And, but who knows, maybe our trees will look that good when they go in. Uh, and the, the lighting, of course, is not New York City based lighting. But the point we're trying to depict here is we are not trying to, to run ramshod through the neighborhood. Uh, we understand what it should look like. We're willing to restrict it. We're willing to restrict the uses. We're willing to restrict the height. Uh, we're asking that you could help us find a path to that. So that's our presentation. Thank you for listening to the dilemma. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Eric. Just a, a couple of questions before I turn it over to Council Member Levin. Um, so, just just can you tell us a little bit more about the history of the site and how long it's been uh, vacant or used as a vehicle storage? Uh, it's it's active. It's not vehicle storage. It's active. They have a contracting company, an excavation company. It's been used like that for decades. Joe Passatoro is the next speaker. He could give you the exact amount of time that it's been used like that, but it is active. They come in every day on a day like today, the diesel trucks start up. They'll tell you what time they have to run for a significant period of time before they could be warmed up. So in the winter, they crank up, they spew emissions and they go for a while until they're warm. And he'll tell you how long they've been doing that for and what they do there. I don't know if he could testify individually, if you can call on him. Joe, can you speak? Is he allowed to? Yeah, Joe, can you unmute yourself? Council, Joe was sworn in, correct? Yes. Excuse me? He is part of the uh, applicant panel, yes. Right. Yep. I am here. Hi, Hi Joe. Joe they asked. Go ahead, Eric. I'm here. Go ahead, Eric. It's, it's, it's sorry, it's awkward with the, the, the communication. Joe, uh, they asked how long the property has been utilized by the Spinard family for the use of heavy equipment and sort of what goes on there and how they utilize it. Well, they, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for allowing me to participate. Uh, first of all, I'm a professional engineer and practicing 30 years and I represent my cousins, Mike and Thomas Spinard. They've owned the property 30 years as well. Uh, 
they run dump trucks and other equipment. They work for contractors that do big gas uh, projects for the city. So every, every morning at 5 a.m., you know, all eight or nine dump trucks get started up, and they're back and forth all day during the day, six days a week. But they've owned the property, and it's been used exclusively for that for the past 30 years. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so this ep this application was originally filed back in December of uh, 2014, so almost yes. six, six years ago, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about what happened to that uh, proposal between then and now, and is there a reason this uh, took so long uh, to get certification? Yeah, everything has a reason, right? There's always a story for everything in life. So the story here goes, and I'll let the councilman explain it to you better. He could probably do better than I can. Is across the street, there was at one point a church that I believe had some issues in the past that might have been demolished in the middle of the night under some zoning development pressure. And we sort of we stepped into the proposal in 2014, right when that was a, a very hot topic of conversation in the community. It caused a lot of speculation and uncertainty over what should be occurring. Uh, and when it should occur. And I think that everybody involved wanted to get their handle, a handle on how people were feeling about the events that transpired on that adjacent parcel before committing to allowing us to move full steam ahead. Uh, once that sort of settled down, which took some time and was a, nobody's doing that's on this call uh, or involved, once that happened, uh, we immediately sat down, in, probably in 2015, I'd imagine, with, as I said before, the councilman, uh, uh, Aldona, who lives next door, who's the head of the Civic Association. It might not have been 15 or 16, but it was sometime a few years ago, as well as the community board. And we started to talk about what we were doing and, and presenting it. So what's been going on, we, we have presented the whole way through. Uh, I'd say it, it took a normal amount of time to go through a ULRF once it kicked into gear. It just took a while to get into gear because of the, the, the situation that occurred across the street. Okay. Um and then how, how did the applicant come uh, to decide on the proposed uh, R6A uh, C24 uh, zoning district? Okay, so that came about through two different forces that worked at the same exact time, or three really. One was city planning, one was the applicant, and the third is the community. The first thing that happened was, was city planning expressed after what happened across the street, a desire to see higher density residential development over there, or at least the opportunity for it. They felt as if it was the appropriate thing to map in that area. We started meeting with the community and were presented with the request for a smaller building. So we asked for a hybrid, a, a 2.6 FAR, that let us get a slightly higher FAR than an R6B would address the concerns of city planning by providing an R6A and allow the owner to have a four-story residential building with some ground floor commercial, which the commercial is really helps out a little bit, or at least it did before the pandemic. So that was how we got here. And, and we had committed to the R6A, to the, to the four-story. Uh, we, never, we never came so far with the community to develop any sort of restrictive declaration. But the plans that, we have in front of, that you have in front of you now are the same plans that have been presented since day one. Uh, the building, the plans have never been bigger. The building's never been taller. Got it. Um, the, the applicant explicitly states that they intend to avoid participating in mandatory inclusionary housing uh, by building below the threshold, uh, 10 units or 12,500 square feet. The proposed building would be about a 2.6 FAR, leaving approximately 6,500 uh, square feet unused, but allowable for R6A districts which is, is a significant amount under the proposal. Uh, typically applicants try to maximize uh, their floor area based on the proposed zoning. Can you discuss um, why the applicant intends to build below the MIS? Yeah, yes. Uh, if the applicant was not in a discussion with the community and height was allowed to be achieved without un, 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 with unimpeded, we would be able to achieve the, the, the full build, build out of the proposed rezoning of the R6A of a 3.6. At that point, we would be able to fulfill uh, the mandatory inclusionary housing requirement. Uh, at, at, the, at the lower FAR that we're at right now and the height of the building and the cost of construction, it, it doesn't work out 
so well to go up another floor, trigger MIH, and, and then provide on this size of a building, uh, provide back 25% of that to MIH, jeopardizes the whole project unless the project gets bigger. And that was a discussion that we, we had, a lot of people have been partaking in uh, in the early onset of this. And that's the rationale for it. Uh, it's not so much that nobody wants to provide the affordable component, but it is that we're balancing the full build outs with that. Okay. And my last two very, very quick questions. Um, the community board and borough president both recommended this approval um, with the borough president recommending the application be withdrawn and refiled as an R6B district. Yeah. Is the applicant considering taking this step? Uh, no. And no? Okay. No, I'll tell you why. It's, it's, it would waste another half a million dollars and it would waste all of your time because you'd spend another seven years of, your all, of all of our resources reviewing it, we'd lose again. Because we've been told abundantly clear, we, we had the opportunity to make it R6B in front of city planning. We had the chance. We could have changed the paperwork and not been out of scope. We could have filed an A application, so, which would have so, ran contiguous. So are there any alternatives being explored that might satisfy the local stakeholders' concerns? We're hoping that they'll accept the restrictive declaration that we'll be willing to sign in blood, our blood, uh, and, and, and really tie ourselves down any which way we can. Again, I was very impressed with what Councilman Lander with the solution that he brought to the table with the text change. And that certainly gave me a lot of thought for future applications. Uh, but this one is too small, I think, to solicit a text change. And uh, so the only tool that's really in the toolbox is a restrictive deck. And I'm gonna, I think that neighbors have serious concerns with that, which is why we are where we are. Okay. But, but has the owner, um here ever considered uh, development under the current uh, M12 zoning? That, that is where it will end up if it gets denied, obviously. You know, I've been telling the neighbors next door, these gentlemen are older, they'll, they'll be leaving and they'll sell it to the highest and best use for an M1 use. Uh, that's not their desire. They use it right now, you know, to park their trucks. But there's not that many end users out there these days that are parking trucks and not too many that want to go into Vinegar Hill and live next door to a very vocal civic association and start driving up their trucks. So, you know, it's, it's, they have no intention though. They're not, they're in the truck business. That's their business, you know, and, and they were planning on developing the property with Joseph, who's an engineer uh, and, and moving on in their lives. And that was their intention. So if they don't, if the rezoning doesn't go, they will not be, they'll most likely not be the developers of a, of a commercial use there. That'll probably be an owner occupied next use that'll come in. Uh, thank you. Thank you for um, uh, taking my questions. Uh, I now want to invite my colleagues to ask questions. Um, if you have questions for the applicant panel, please use the raise hand button on the participant panel. Uh, council, are there any council members that have uh, any questions? Yeah, I don't see any members with questions for I the so let me let me then turn it over. Thank you, uh, Arthur. Let me turn it over to Council Member um, Levin for a few questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, thanks for the presentation, Eric. Can you explain what the um, what an, an R six A as of right development would be? How many units? How many affordable units? What the height would be? I, I don't have it broken down in front of me as to how many units, but obviously it would be a 3.6 built FAR. It, it would be a 75 foot tall building to be developed uh, with 3.6. So it's a 6,000 square foot lot. So you're roughly at about a 20,000, 24,000 square foot building that could be built. That could be a seven, eight story building with a qualifying ground floor, similar to what you see across the street right now. So okay, uh, twenty four thousand feet. You said, yeah, about tw about. I mean, I'm make, I'm going, I'm winging it, but it's a, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, it's a six thousand square foot lot. So we're talking about maybe five, five affordable units would be. Excuse me, it's a ten thousand. I take it back. It's a ten thousand. I apologize. Ten thousand square foot lot. So it would be a four point six. So it'd be a much larger. It'd be forty six thousand square feet if it could fit within the envelope. I doubt mm -hmm. it would be able to fit within the envelope, but I could get you the exact numbers. I didn't spend so much time focusing on it because we never proposed it. So, 
And what's the size of the? Okay, so forty six would be your as of right R six A, and you're and you're proposing to limit it to to sixteen thousand square feet. Sixteen. Okay. Um, so that's significantly. Um, you're limiting it to about a third of the density that you could achieve under an R six A. Yeah. Um, and, and take, a, I mean, those are rough numbers for everybody's knowledge. Mm -hmm. so I don't want to make that. I don't mean to misrepresent the number if I made a mistake, but I and what and right. what would it, what would an R six B um, uh, uh, square footage full, be? Full build out would be about twenty two thousand square feet, and we're at sixteen. If you, go any higher we're than we're 17. We're 17. But if you go so any higher than, than 17, it would that's you would trigger MIH. MIH is not that you have a problem with MIH. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I don't doesn't seem to me that you have a problem with MIH. Um, but you know, would not would not be financially feasible to do without something much closer approaching R6A's than yeah. Listen, MIH is designed to be done. It's a privately, you all know it. It's designed to be maxed out, and that's how it works. When you max it out, it, it works well. Mm -hmm. It works. I don't know if it works well, but it works to some extent. Yeah. You know, but well, let me ask a question, it, Eric. It what would be the what would be the um, what would be the tipping point in terms of square footage that would um, makes sense for the applicant to do, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but would I can make sense for the applicant to do a, uh, a, a an MIH project? It, it, I mean? it pertains, yeah, it pertains to the method of construction once the building goes over four stories. So when the building starts going up higher, I think the, the, the frame, Joe, can you give shed some light from an engineering perspective on the costs that get into place once the building starts going uh, over four or five stories? Are you still there? I don't know if Joe can testify right now, Joe Passatoro, but it comes into the cost because it gets substantially more expensive when you get higher. So yeah, basically, basically what we said. Now, I'm, I'm, I, I just wanted to ask a quick question to myself because I'm a little confused. At an R6B, we're at a 2.0 FAR, and the lot is 6,700 square feet. At an R6A, I believe we're at a 3.0 FAR. Uh, and again, the lot being 6,700 square feet. So I just wanted to make that one. Yeah, I, that's, I was looking at my notes. I called out the rezoning area, Councilman Levin, before when I said 10,000. I was looking quickly. It was, oh, I see. Okay, right. I apologize. It's not quite, that's why it's not I, quite a tripling of. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And this is something that we could. It's good for the record, but we could, could you know, that's fine. We could talk about that. But but the point your point is well taken, and I think Joe, what happens when you what he's trying to get at is what happens when you go taller to your costs. Well, obviously, the more square footage you build, the more the, the, the higher the cost. But once you get above certain height, you have other building code requirements that come into play. But even with the MIH, we had said we wanted nine units with some ground floor commercial. It's a relatively small project. We were willing to go MIH, and all we said was, well, listen, give us the zoning for every one MIH you want. Give me another free market one above the nine units, and we'll do whatever you want us to do. We, my, son, my, cousin, my cousins are willing to do anything that the community will allow them to do. It's just that we feel like we're trapped between a rock and a hard place right now in, in, terms, of, in terms of this. Uh, they want to you know, close down. I was the one who personally suggested, personally suggested, hey, listen, you guys want to think about retiring now. Let's do this. But as um, Eric, you know, so eloquently said, you know, we started this eight years ago. Eric had hair back then. Uh, and now what we, you know, what we're looking to propose, the R6A is dead in the community. The R6B is dead as far as uh, city, city planning is concerned. So they're going to start entertaining offers to just sell it for an M12. And as Councilman uh, Councilmember Landis so eloquently put, I don't see any M12 use that can benefit the community right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, Ms. <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Pastor, Mr. Turo, um, so, so you're saying that um, above the nine units, for every, you would be willing to do MIH and match basically one for one 
uh, market rate to affordable unit? We could do that, but the problem you run into with doing that is it's such a small lot, we, then the parking situation kicks into play. And on a 6,700 square foot lot, you don't really have much room for parking. And you know that, that would involve us putting in an underground parking garage, and that substantially increases the cost of construction. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, I'm, you know, obviously, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to continue talking. Um, but as I think we'll hear from, uh, members of the community, you know, um, this community has been very clear that they don't see on these corners and R6A as a, as a suitable zoning designation. I know that this applicant did not push for it and requested from city planning that they be allowed to pursue an alternate 6B application. Um, you know, this is one circumstance where the community, the developer, and the elected um, council member and borough president and community board all seem to be aligned that a 6B would be an appropriate um, a designation and and it's city planning that um, that disagrees. And just just to be clear, um, and, I, and just because I, I know that this has come up, you know, uh, Vinegar Hill happens to be in a very um, uh, higher income census tract that um, that is largely skewed by um, by the the other half of the census tract, which is in Dumbo. So that's skewed upwards. Um, you know, Vinegar Hill itself, the residents that I know that live in the kind of old 19th century buildings are all um, art, you know, older artists, people that uh, union members, people that um, that uh, Put a lot of sweat equity into their buildings uh, that may that may in fact own a building that is worth a lot of money but but are not high income earners per se that's not to say that there aren't some um you know some of the more recent developments in vinegar hill might have some expensive condominiums and, and such but um you know the members of the vinegar hill neighborhood association that i've known for the last 11 years um are are not that um you know and are not necessarily um high income earners so just for for members of the public i know that there's there's uh, uh i've seen some public commentary about the census tract itself that census tract includes um uh, parts of dumbo that have been significantly developed with with um higher higher range um uh income uh, uh condominiums and, and rentals um, this is a neighborhood that is uh, literally across the street from a, uh, from a, a NYCHA development, Farragut houses. Um, uh, we just, um, rezoned not too long ago, um, uh, probably the biggest, um, supportive housing developments in the, I don't and since I think I've been at the council, I don't know if there's been one, um, uh, at the at the Watchtower building about uh, four and a half blocks away at 90 Sand Street, 500 units of affordable housing, 300 of which are supportive for formerly homeless. So, you know, it's not, this is not a, a NIMBY, I know maybe it might look like it's a NIMBY question here. This is not a NIMBY question. This is a community that uh, welcomes affordable housing. Um, uh, this is about whether um, it's appropriate to be citing R6A um, throughout Vinegar Hill, which is basically the um, the context or the, that that we would be establishing. And and just to be clear, across the street at uh, 251 Front Street, um, uh, we we asked the applicant in that development about uh, two years ago to withdraw their application because um, 6A was uh, seen as, as, uh, as too big and they were not willing to go to a 6B. So 
um, puts us, I agree with Eric, it does put us in a bit of a conundrum. I'm continue to be open to, uh, to discussing the matter and, and uh, trying to see if there's a point of consensus. Thank you, sorry um, for that. Thank you, council member 11. Um, thank you. Uh, council, do we have uh, any uh, colleagues that uh, wish to ask the uh, panel any questions? Uh, it appears that council member 11. Uh, yes, sorry, I was, I, I, I muted myself. But just to be clear, um, you know, I, I, I stand with the community in, in saying that a full 6A uh, build out is, um, is, is not appropriate. Um, uh, and, and so I agree with, with the community. So I just want to be clear about that. If I may, may I ask one question, please? Joseph, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a land use expert that, you know, I, I, Eric has more than that, but I just wanted to know why aren't we allowed to submit an A application? I can answer that if you'd like. Hold on. Go on. Joseph, can you hear me? Yeah, I don't care who answers it. I just was curious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Eric. Joseph, the window to have done that was before the city planning commission hearing. At that point, they could have entertained an A application. Once they acted on it, uh, it goes here. I think theoretically the council may be able to entertain an A application and, and bring it back to city planning, but I don't think it would be right. supported at city planning. But I believe that, um, that's the mechanism. So, so once, once, and, once the process goes through city planning, as Eric was saying, you're basically done at that point. So that's the, that's the, that's the, the gist of it. Um, and and Joseph, okay. just to be yeah. clear, I, I expressed support for an A application at city planning and city planning didn't agree. I appreciate city, it. Thank you city, very much. City, city planning feels strongly that this should be a, an R6A area. So that, that, you know, that's where, they thought that, that that 251 Front Street should have been an R6A. So that's kind of where we are. This has been kind of a, a uh, longer running disagreement between um, the community and and city planning, frankly. It's been very frustrating because you know we basically spent eight years of our lives and hundreds of thousands of dollars and we're basically trapped in between two agencies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. There being, um, uh, let me just ask one more time. Council, do we have any council members who um, wish to ask the panel any questions? Uh, Tara, I see no, mem no other members uh, at this time with questions. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, the uh, applicant panel uh, is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 265 Front Street rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, there are approximately seven public witnesses who have signed up to speak. Great. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witness panels will be called in groups of up to four names uh, per panel. If you hear your name being called, please stand by and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed as a group and the next group of speakers will be introduced. After you have been removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Monique Denonson, Per Olaf Odman, Aldana Valsiunas, and Linda McAllister. And the first speaker on this panel will be Monique Denonson. 
Time begins Thank you, Council. Um, I just want to remind members of the public that you will be given uh, two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. So, Monique, yeah, you may begin when you're ready. Time starts now. Monique? Hello. Hi, Monique. You can begin oh. whenever you're ready. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, dear council member, I will reiterate what I said through this ULO process. My strong opposition to the rezoning of 265 Front Street to an R6A. Our community has suffered the loss of a beautiful church and its rectory that stood perfectly in the middle of Inegger Hill. Our fight to save them was unsuccessful, but we worked really hard to preserve our neighborhood, which was designated a New York City Historic District in 1997. The following year, we managed to rezone Vinegar Hill from an M12 to an R6B to keep it in scale of our simple early 19th century houses. We are acutely aware of the unique appeal of Vinegar Hill, cobblestone streets, and the low-rise houses. We are determined to keep it as unaltered as possible. There are no reason to now change our proper R6B to an R6A, a change that will create a model to other tall buildings in the neighborhood. While I see with horror what has happened to Dumbo, becoming so different with many high rises, and it has lost its identity forever. It has now the massive 85 J Street building uh, that looming all around. It sells a penthouse for $7,850,000. While Vinegar Hill is a very different neighborhood, there are no multimillionaires here. Our neighbors come in all skin, skin colors. We live next to the big Farragut city houses by choice. At a short walking distance, 90 Sand Street Tower will soon provide about 500 units Time expired. to former homeless, low-income, and extremely low-income New Yorkers. I do praise our councilman, Steve Levin, for this. Now, council member, you have the power to destroy Vinegar Hill by changing our zoning to hypothetically okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Monique. Thank you so much. Of low income units at 265. Thank you, Monique. Thank you. But it is the not time justifiable. Has I am Thank done. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Chair, the next speaker will be Per Olaf Odman, who will be followed by Aldana Vaisinus. Per, uh, whenever you're ready. Time starts now. Do you hear me? We hear you. Do you hear me, council members? We can hear you whenever you're ready. Okay. Yes. Dear council members, I will talk for approximately two and a half minutes. My <laughs> name is Per Oldman. I'm retired from the United States Marine Corps. I'm retired due to disability. In Vietnam in 1968, I was very seriously wounded in combat. I've been an anti-war activist for the last 50 years. War and combat have made me very aware of the suffering of many, many thousands of New Yorkers who deserve decent housing. I support our mayors and our council members' efforts to create housing through mandatory inclusionary housing. With the help of Council Member Steve Levin, a former Jehovah's Witness Hotel in Dumbo, 
is being converted into a very large building containing 491 apartments solely for low-income New Yorkers. As a combat veteran, I'm proud of a lot of the rich history of the United States, the city of New York, and the unique and irreplaceable history of Vinegar Hill, a very small neighborhood of mostly early 19th century three- and four-story residential buildings in which I have been living since 1976. 265 Front Street is located in Vinegar Hill. If the city council zones 265 Front Street to R6A, a developer can, as of right, build an 85-foot-tall, eight-story building which will tower over Vinegar Hill. Such a tall building will destroy Vinegar Hill. An R6A building at 265 Front Street can contain at the most eight MIH apartments. No matter how much one is in favor of the use of MIH, logically, it does not make sense to destroy a very historical neighborhood to gain a few small MIH apartments. Most of Billinger Hill is zoned R6B. I hereby strongly urge the city council to zone 265 Front Street to R6B, which accurately reflects the character of Vinegar Hill. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, and thank you for your service. Thank you. The next speaker uh, chair on this panel will be Aldona Isiunas who will be followed by Linda McAllister. The next speaker, Aldona Vaisiunas. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Aldona. Whenever you're ready. Great. My name is Aldona Vechinis, and I'm the president of the Vinegar Hill Neighborhood Association and a resident of Vinegar Hill for the last 61 years. I am here to oppose the upzoning of 265 Front Street. In 2017, members of the community met with the Spin Arts, their attorney, and CB2. We told them we would not approve anything higher than R6B with no commercial overlay. Obviously, you can see that they totally disregard what the community wanted by filing for R6A. As with any neighborhood that is presented with new and higher development, there is the fear of displacement and gentrification, especially when zoning is changed for luxury housing or for the benefit of the developer. There will be no affordability here. This project does not take into account any affordability for lower income families, individuals, senior citizens, former homeless or even workforce housing. There is no talk of any low affordable programs such as ELLA or HCR. Do not be fooled. This is luxury housing. The project does not intend to have any MIH units, even if it is upzoned to R6A. Vinegar Hill is not opposed to any new development in the neighborhood, and we are deeply aware of our city's housing crisis. We are not reflective opponents of development, nor are we NIMBYs. Development can and should answer the shifting demographic and financial ecosystem of New York with proportional development density, aesthetic sensitivity, and economic justice. Badly done, gentrification not only destroys history and culture, but destroys neighborhoods. There are studies that prove that rents in upzone neighborhoods accelerate faster and diversity drops, leading to displacement. This is not what we want to see happen in Vinegar Hill. We are a neighborhood of artists, union members, city workers, senior citizens, and HDFC homeowners. Something that the city doesn't take into account when assessing MIH housing, instead lumping us with the high expensive neighborhood of Dumbo. Grandfathered buildings in Vinegar Hill that are higher than eight stories were built prior to the 1998 rezoning and are the exception, not the norm. Regardless that the commercial overlay has been taken out of the picture, we are, we are sure that this property will flip once this is zoned to R6A. As Community Board 2 in the Brooklyn Borough President's Office had denied it 
for upzoning to R6A, we cur- encourage City Council to do the same and continue to uphold the 1998 rezoning of Vinegar Hill. Thank you. The next and final speaker on this panel will be Linda McAllister. Linda McAllister will be the next speaker. Time starts now. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling in from the phone. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Linda, whenever you're ready. Okay. Due to this unprecedented pandemic, New York City finds itself in uncharted waters along with the entire world. Prior to this chaotic year, when we could still hold hearings in person, both Borough President Adams and our community board told the Spinards no. No to a restrictive declaration, no to commercial space. Now they're back asking for the same. They were upfront about the potential number of units which would allow them to avoid inclusionary housing. The members of our low rise landmark historic district honestly believe that in light of our current economic crisis, they probably have no intention of following through with their construction of townhouses within our R6B zoning. I personally think the goal is to subvert R6B and sell the land to the highest bidder. Uh, Our main man, Steve Levin, went over the number of units going into the Jehovah's uh, Hotel, which is approximately two-tenths of a mile from the beginning of the night to Farragut Houses, the border of Vinegar Hill being on one side of Bridge Street, Dumbo starting on the other, as well as the massive construction on what we used to call Jehovah's Parking Pit. City planning gave the witnesses their variance over a dozen years ago, despite major community objection, giving them the green light to wait until the same the sale price reached the stratosphere. There was no need for the buyers to worry about variances. Everything was in place. As a result, there won't be even one unit of affordable housing when this gargantuan project is completed. Our zip code of 11201 has more affordable housing than most. It's time for city planning to stop handing out approvals like candy. Do not plan on an economic future that may not bounce back with the first round of vaccinations or even possibly within the decade. Over a third of a million people have fled our city during this pandemic. The Times reported back in 18 or 19 that of the massive amount of luxury high-rises built in this century alone, most have barely a third occupancy. And there are other developers waiting in the wings to see what you decide. If you approve, they will say, well, if they got around R6B, we should be allowed to do so as well. Let's work on filling our existing structures before you, any Linda. more are Thank built. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you to the panel um, for their testimony. If any council members have questions for this panel, please indicate uh, by using the raise hand button. Chair Moya, Council Member 11 has his hand raised. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, thank this panel. Um, uh, these are all individuals that um, uh, I've worked with uh, in the neighborhood. Um, they've built up that neighborhood and and um, have um, you know have, have have taken a stewardship role. Um, in ensuring that Vinegar Hill not not become um, like Dumbo, which has become a um, you know a, a very um, expensive and um, um, an overdeveloped neighborhood, and so um, I just want to thank them for their very thoughtful testimony and for continuing to work with us. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Um, Okay, council, if you can please call up the next panel. Oh, I'm sorry, um, if there are no more questions for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, and then council, if you can, please call up uh, the next panel. Chair Moya, the next panel will include Harry Bubbins. Harry Bubbins will be the next speaker.
Hi there. Hello. I'm Scott Snyder. Hi. Thanks a lot, uh, and thank you to the community members for working really hard on this matter. Um, I just want to bring to the attention for the record that the public was informed that there would not be public speaking on the first item today, 312 Coney Island Avenue. And so that's why no one was there to speak today on this controversial matter. Uh, the public was informed by council staff on the council website and by council member Brad Lander's staff that there would not be public testimony on 312 Coney Island today. And that's why you didn't hear from anyone. So I just wanted to share that for the record. And uh, I support community struggles and efforts across the city. Thank you. Sorry, had a little bit of a problem there. Okay, um, if you can pose your own questions for this panel chair, or you can see if there are. Are there any other? Um, Council members who have any questions uh, for the panelists? Chair, I see no members uh, with questions for this panel. Okay, thank you. Um, there being no more questions for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, can you please call up the next panel? Next panel will include Margot Hirsch, Bartow Church, and Jennifer Razor. The first speaker on the panel will be Margot Hirsch, followed by Bartow Church. I'm starts now. Good morning, Council. This is Margot Hirsch. Good morning, Margot. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya, for holding this hearing. And thank you, Councilman Levin, for all your work on our behalf. I do want to thank and acknowledge both Community Board 2 and the Borough President uh, Adams for supporting our community in our very long and continuing fight to maintain the, the context of the community, which is unique in New York City. Uh, my, the former panel members have said everything that I would have said, and I'm certainly not going to waste your time by repeating it. I do just want to highlight a couple of issues. The R6A buildings that were mentioned um, were all pre-existing. There has been no conversion to R6A since our original change to R6B zoning. So for example, the building across from the lot is the old Pressler Toy Factory, which is probably you know, 75 to 100 years old that was R6A converted to residential. The empty lot across the street, the huge empty lot is R6B. Um, I'm sure that if, if this change in zoning goes through, we'll see another fight on our hand. The restrictive agreement that was talked so much about is a private matter, which would leave it up to the community of people who live here to defend that in the courts if it came to that which is an extremely onerous burden on a small community. Most of the people in this neighborhood have lived here for decades. I own, I have, we have owned our house for over 37 years. We raised our family here. Uh, the building next to us is fourth generation in the neighborhood as is the building next to that. Most people moved here originally because it was affordable. The fact that Dumbo right. has grown up around us is really to our detriment, not to our benefit. Um, and finally, the proposal was never for more than five, for nine units. No matter what um, uh, 
they are telling you today, the, you, the plan was always nine units so that it could avoid mandatory um, inclusion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Margot. Thank you for your testimony. The next speaker will be Barto Church, who will be followed by Jennifer Razor. Barto Church. Hey, guys. Um, you can hear me good? We can hear you. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to share our testimony um, to all the council members and everybody involved. My name is Bardo Church. I live at 75 Gold Street, which is immediately adjacent to the 265 Front Street site. And this is my fourth time providing formal testimony against this project. And I'm happy to do it 10 more times or whatever may be necessary, as with my other neighbors. My past testimony, I've mostly focused on how this upzoning was inappropriate for the low lying streets and our historic neighborhood. Today, I wanted to focus more on the nature of the conversations we've had with the owners of the property. Because frankly, it gets a little painted, uh, painted very rosy by the owner's attorney as this open dialogue with our community and how they try, really try to work with us and how also the owners have just been this important members of our community. Um, they also seem to age every time we have these uh, meetings. They've been 55, they're 65, now they're 75. In any event, um, none of this is you know, the case on any of these accounts. Uh, the owners and their attorney, Eric, approached the neighborhood back, like they said, in 2015-16 about developing this lot. Uh, for residential and they'd be applying for R6A. At that time, we explained we couldn't support that, but would gladly support R6B, which as you've heard before from everybody here is the overall envelope of our neighborhood, um, apart from the, the few buildings mentioned. Uh, and taking this initial meeting with the developers, you know, we really think that we were just effectively being humored and asking what we wanted and they simply wanted the optics of listening to the neighbors. They, of course, pushed forward R6A despite our pleas, and only when beginning to feel resistance from the city, uh, that's when the promises started coming along about building smaller, making it more historic, dangling things like, oh, they'll lease whatever we want in the commercial space. And the truth is, you know, they've had eight years to withdraw this application and apply for R6B, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. You know, we would, and Bye. as we said, we would have fully supported that, but rather uh, they chose to plow ahead. Eventually they try to offer these restrictive declarations, but it's always felt like a ruse. We all know these declarations once agreed upon become a civil matter and our small association just can't afford to litigate against a breach of contract with these owners or the deep pocket developers they inevitably flip it to. We've never seen any evidence of this working. I've only seen evidence to the contrary looking at 85J, which was once a school. Thank you. thank you for your time and thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Jennifer Razor. Jennifer Razor. Time starts now. Good morning, Councilman. This, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. My name is Jennifer Razor, and I moved to 69 Gold Street and represent the newer base residents of the neighborhood. My home is a landmark preserved townhouse in the historic district of the Nutter Hill, about, and I moved here about six years ago and, just, and lived just five small lots down from 265 Front, Front Street. I moved to this neighborhood to escape the rapid development and changes in the city and in Brooklyn. Based on earlier testimony, it is clear that myself and many of my neighbors are highly opposed to the R6A spot zoning application and that we feel is not appropriate for 265 Front Street. If you have had the chance to visit Vinegar Hill or if you haven't visited recently, I encourage you to do so and visit one of our two neighborhood restaurants on Hudson Street. As the owner's um, legal representative, Eric, showed in his presentation, it's like going back in history. And as Councilman Levin and others have mentioned, Vinegar Hill is a tiny neighborhood with very narrow Belgian block streets, rows of small pre-Civil War brick and frame houses with quaint ground floor storefronts that have been converted into homes. It's a jewel of a neighborhood, the last of its kind in Brooklyn, and we want to preserve it and protect it. In Vinegar Hill, we have managed to welcome thoughtful and progressive change, including a supporting infrastructure of our area. We support small businesses in the neighborhood like the two restaurants, Vinegar Hill House and Cafe Jatani, as well as supporting many artists, including Jen Lewin Studio on Water Street. If the owners of 265 Front really want to work with us, they would take the time to pursue the R6B zoning. And I ask this council to enforce and request the developers to apply for R6B. We are also working closely with other developers in the neighborhood, including um, Edry Development, who has purchased 288 Water Street 
directly behind my brownstone and some of my neighbors on Gold Street. The developers worked very closely with us to ensure he doesn't disrupt the neighborhood's appeal by not building beyond the zoning and feels very strongly about working with us to enhance the neighborhood without destroying its charm. Again, an R6PA or any other larger development will increase the density of our neighborhood and narrow the streets. I appreciate your time for this. Thank you, Jennifer. This. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, council, um, do we have any council members um, that wish to uh, ask any questions to this panel? Uh, Chair Moya, I see no members uh, with questions for this panel. Okay. There being uh, no other members uh, of, the, of, of this panel, this panel is now excused. Council, we're gonna pause for, for a few seconds. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the 265 Front Street rezoning proposal? Please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we wait for members of the public. Chair Moya, we have an additional public speaker uh, on this item. The next speaker will be Doreen Gallo. Doreen Gallo will be the next speaker. Time starts now. Uh, uh, can you hear me? You can hear you. Okay, I will start. Um, this testimony is on behalf of the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance, uh, our referred to as DNA for 265 Front Street. DNA is against the zoning requested by the applicant and asks you to consider a more appropriate R6B that supports the Vinegar Hill Historic District. DNA testified at city planning's 1998 rezoning hearings for the Vinegar Hill Neighborhood Association a year after the Vinegar Hill Historic District was designated. The Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance supported city planning's R6B recommendation for part of the Vinegar Hill neighborhood that was rezoned R6B with a 50 foot height limit. The R6B districts are oftentimes traditional row house districts that help preserve the scale character and the harmonious streetscapes of the neighborhood. Now more than ever, we need to take those recommendations seriously. While we are encouraged by the applicant's desire to elevate the conditions of their property, and I don't mean by change of use, they chose to let it look like that. They could have made a, you know, a more sightly uh, facade for their manufacturer use. Uh, we propose that the R6B zoning would be a more appropriate recommendation to the adjacent historic district. We firmly believe that if the adjacent strips of manufacturing are to be rezoned, they should be placed in an R6B category to match the existing low rise nature of this neighborhood and bolster the historic district. The Vinegar Hill Historic District, which is composed of three small groups of brick Greek Revival Row Houses is a residential remnant of the early 19th century neighborhood that occupied the blocks between the Brooklyn Bridge and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Industrial expansion and transportation improvements in the early 20th century resulted in the demolition of many of the original structures. The groups of houses that survive within the Vinegar Hill Historic District retain their historical architectural character and creates a unique sense of place recalling a significant era in Brooklyn's history. We respectfully ask that you reject this proposed zoning in its entirety. The spot zoning, including the commercial retail component proposed, will not only set a misguided precedent for future development on the many vacant lots without a comprehensive plan, 
please understand that this upzoning will not only affect Vinegar Hill, but its adjacent neighbors. Um, I want to just also comment on the, you know, just the actual structure. Uh, well, one, one piece um, before I say that. Uh, it, there's a concern that the project does not include MIH, and by approving this proposal, you're setting a precedent that an R6 A rezoning can be approved without MIH units, and this is not the intent of mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, and just about the building itself, um, I'm a longtime member of the Historic Districts Council, and my okay. Um, Thank you, Irene. Okay. Thank you Never so mind. much. Thank okay. You. Thank you for your testimony today. Okay. Um, there being no uh, other members of the public uh, who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the 265 uh, Front Street rezoning application, uh, the public hearing is now closed and the application is laid over. But I'd also like to remind um, those uh, in the public that if you wish to email your testimony, you can email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. That is landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and that concludes today's business. And I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council and land use and other council staff uh, and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's meetings. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.